everyone, and thank you so much for attending Nature Hiking for Beginners. Before we get started, just a few house, quick housekeeping reminders. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A box to submit them, and we'll get to them either during the presentation itself or afterwards in the Q&A section. Um, also, uh, July 31st, so just in a couple of days, is the last day to sign up for summer reading. So if you haven't already, head to your local SCCLD library and sign up today. Now, I would like to introduce our two speakers for today, Andrew and Greg. They are both park rangers with the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space Park District. Andrew is an alumni of CSU Chico and has been with the district for nine years. Prior to that, he worked at several different park agencies, including the City of Chico, Sonoma County Parks, Army Corps of Engineers, and US Forest Service. Andrew aims to incorporate his experience from his days as a Boy Scout with his experience as a Ranger to create programming for teenagers and young adults that helps them safely use local park lands. Greg has been with the district as a park ranger for 16 years, having worked as a seasonal open space technician during his first summer. He has also worked for California State Parks as a park aide, Santa Clara County Parks as a maintenance technician, and the city of Santa Cruz as a beach ranger. Greg grew up loving the outdoors and believes that getting paid to do the things he loves is priceless. Quote, the best part of being a ranger is helping people in their time of need and protecting our natural resources. Andrew and Greg, take it away. Hello everyone, I'm Greg Smutnak. And I'm Andrew Verberge. And today we'll be talking about hiking for beginners. So our outline for today, we'll start off with what to bring on your hike. It's basically gonna be a 10 essential list of items. Then we'll go into how to plan a hike, how to research where to go, what weather to expect and times of day to go that would be best, environmental hazards that you may come across. This would be like plants and animals in the parks, some example hikes for beginners, and then my favorite part, lessons from a ranger. So what to bring on your hike? If you're a beginner, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, what do I bring on my hike? Um, where to start? So a couple things to start with is you need water. Water is probably the most important thing you could take on your hike. You always wanna bring more water than not enough. Um, if you don't bring enough water, your, your hike is gonna be miserable. Along with water, you wanna bring your favorite foods or snacks. That could be candy bars, that could be chips. If you wanna make yourself a, a sandwich, you could take that with you. But any type of like comfort foods, please take on your hike with you because that'll make your hike more enjoyable too. First aid is pretty important. So you wanna personalize your first aid kit. If, you're, if you have allergies or allergic to bee, bee stings, bring an EpiPen because if something, if you're gonna get stung by a bee or a wasp out there and you don't have your EpiPen, um, it can turn into a better medical, a bigger medical issue than really needs to be. If you're diabetic, bring your insulin or something sweet. So if you feel that coming on, you have something to remedy that uh, your di diabetic emergency. And also if you have asthma, bring your inhaler because the last thing you want is to be out in the middle of the trail uh, somewhere far from your car and you have an asthma attack. So it's really important to have any type of um, personal remedies that you need for being out on a hike. As far as hygiene is concerned, sunscreen is always a big one. This, the sun is very strong and if you're out on a trail that's open, um, you need to put that sunscreen on so you don't get sunburned, especially your arms, your face, and your neck. Insect repellent is another big one because certain times of the day in the morning or early evening, the mosquitoes like to come out. And nothing is worse than hiking down a trail and you're swatting your skin all the time because the mosquitoes are landing on you. And plus you don't wanna get home and then we all know insect bikes, they're itchy and they're just annoying. Toiletries is another big one. If you have to go, you gotta go. So toilet paper, bring that along. Um, if you do have to go, we just ask that you go 50 feet from the trail. If you have a little trowel, you can dig yourself a, a little hole, or if you don't, you can always use a stick or your boot to dig a hole. Do your business, use your toilet paper, put it over <clears throat> in the hole and then just cover it up with dirt. And if there's a rock or, or a small log or piece of wood somewhere, you can put that on top of that. That'll keep the, the critters from getting into that. And hand sanitizer, it seems to be a staple with everything. So bring your hand sanitizer. 
layers, you always want to bring layers appropriate for the time of day and the season that you're hiking in. Um, you could start out and it's a beautiful day. Um, you're hiking, you get sweaty. And then as it's getting later, you start getting cold because now your shirt's all wet. So it's always good to bring a light jacket or um, a light pair of pants. Now to tie all that in is a backpack and you don't need anything fancy like $150 backpack from REI. You could use your, your school backpack and that's put everything in that you think you'll need on your hike and you'll be all set to go. Another one is your cell phone. Everybody has their cell phone. But a really important thing is make sure your cell phone is fully charged before you go on your hike. Um, bring an extra charger and cord because people like to use their cell phones as flashlights if you happen to be hiking at night because you're running late. And if you're using your cell phone as a flashlight, that'll kill the battery really quick. Along with people like to take videos and, and pictures. So, that's kind of like really important. Just to make sure your phone is charged. So if something does happen, you get lost or there's a medical emergency, you can make that important phone call. And last but not least, I like to tell people, carry a whistle with you. If something happens where you're lost or you get hurt, you can only yell for help for a certain amount of time before your voice starts to go hoarse. But if you have a whistle, you can blow that thing all night long and the whistle sound will actually carry a lot further than your voice will. Anything you want to add, Andrew? I just want to throw in there with that sunscreen. If you do go all day or for several hours, make sure that you're applying sunscreen several <clears> times. <throat> um, in my eight hour ranger shift, I apply sunscreen three to four times a day on these really sunny days out here. Um, and then with the cell phone, we'll talk about it a lot more later, but cell phones are really handy for downloading maps these days. Um, they have GPSs on them so that you can find your route while you're hiking. Um, and then the cell phones, um, you know, you've always got it there in case you need to make a phone call for some sort of emergency while you're out in the back country. Um, before we move on to the next slide, we do have a question from the audience. Yeah. Does insect repellent work also on non-biting insects like canyon flies? It, it should um, protect you against any type of flying insects. And I also forgot to mention, um, it protects you from ticks too, from crawling up uh, on your pant leg or your legs. And I, I'd be more concerned about the ticks than anything else, just with uh, Lyme disease that's prevalent in uh, the Bay Area and in the Santa Cruz Mountains. So going on to planning your adventure. This is where we're going to start talking about how to find the hike that's right for you. Um, we kind of broke it down into four different subgroups of historical, habitat, exercise, or pleasure. So the first one, historical, um, we can think of this as a lot of times you'll hear interpretive hikes. So these are hikes where you're going to be following some sort of guided path out in the preserves. Um, not every per park is going to have this. So when you were going to do our research online, that's something that you'll look for on their maps. Habitat, this is the environment that you're going to be hiking in. Is this going to be, do you want to go hike in redwoods today? Or do you want to go more of like an open uh, meadow, uh, oak wilderness hike as well? Um, because down here in the Bay Area, we're, we're very, very fortunate. There are lots and lots of different local environments that you can hike in and have completely different experiences at. Uh, the next thing is, are you doing your hike because you just wanna get exercise in? Because there's gonna be plenty of places nearby where if you wanna, if you really do wanna do like a strenuous hike, um, we'll be going over some of the maps and how to read the maps and find out how steep a trail may or may not be. Um, you know, the steeper trail that you do, it's gonna be the more strenuous. If you want to do a very relaxing hike, a pleasurable hike out there, possibly, you're going to be wanting to do something that's very flat to do. Um, this also goes hand in hand with um, how many people do you want to see out there on your hike? There are local preserves and parks where you could have a lot of people interaction. Our Rancho San Antonio Preserve, our Fremont Older Open Space Preserve, these are two places where um, at any moment while you're hiking, there could be somebody else in eyesight of you um, within shouting distance of you. But there's also lots and lots of other parklands where you can go to it and 
it, it's much maybe more remote area. You may only see one or two people hiking out there, if any. Those are great opportunities to just clear your mind, um, kind of get away from it all when you're hiking. Yeah, and just to dovetail off that, um, nature could be a place where life can be stressful, school, work, family, that you could go out and go for a short little hike. If you found an area that has a stream, sit by the stream, listen to the water, um, go out to a nice vista point. You can just think about looking at the city and, and, and enjoying that view. Um, it's really neat when you go out there and, and see people that are reading books or drawing, they find a nice little place where they can just be with themselves and just decompress. And um, that's kind of what nature is all about too. Um, so we do have another question from the audience. Sure. Um, is there any recommended resources you have to look for specific habitats, such as um, serpentine trees, Douglas firs, redwoods, or denser oaks? We do, and we'll get to that um, later on in the presentation uh, when we show um, when we also talk about how to research uh, your hike or adventure um, through different uh, agency websites. So researching your adventure, every park has its own set of rules and regulations, and it's important to know them before you go. Nothing's worse than getting to the park and you think, oh, there's going to be restrooms there. Oh, there's going to be uh, water there, or I'm going to bring my dog there, or I'm going to go on a bike ride there. And you get there and you realize, oh, well, I need a helmet, or you brought your e-bike and, oh, there's no e-bikes allowed or no dogs allowed, or there's no water or restroom. So it's really important to know like, hey, I'm going to go to a Santa Clara County Park. And before I leave, let me do a little research to see, is there water there? Is there a restroom? So when you show up, you know, like, oh, I can bring my dog. So I brought my dog. And then you can just head out on the trail and not have to worry about, oh, I got to go back home, take the dog back, or I got to get a helmet. So researching is very important. And a part of the research is knowing the park rules, the park hours, and um, the regulations. And so when you pull into a parking lot, instead of rushing out to the trail, it's always a good idea also, after you've done your research, is to walk over to the um, regulation signs and the information boards, because you'll find a lot of interesting things about your hike on that trail, like what kind of animals are there, what kind of flowers are there, what kind of trees are there. So there's a lot of good information in the information boards. And then also the reg signs are pretty much what you can and can't do. And yeah, I just want to throw in there as well with the parking. Um, you also don't want to show up at the park and not realize that there's a parking fee to use that park. So there are a few agencies around here, Mid Peninsula Open Space, where Greg and I work. We don't charge for parking in any of our preserves. Santa Clara Open Space Authority, um, they have a lot of preserves in the kind of South Santa Clara area. I don't believe they charge for parking. Um, but like Santa Clara County Parks, it's probably about a 50 50 where Sometimes they charge for parking and sometimes they don't. So that would be something that you want to take a quick look at on their websites. We're about to go over a few of those websites of these local agencies. Um, and on those websites, they always do tell you if there's a parking fee um, for that specific park. So here's where we were going to show the most common park agencies that you may run across in your areas. So Greg and I, like I mentioned, we work for Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. A lot of times you'll hear it commonly referred to as mid pen or open space. Um, the next biggest park agency around here is going to be Santa Clara County Parks. These parks are probably a little bit closer to you. The parks that they have, um, they can range in a lot of different variety. So some of their parks will be basically like open spaces, like mid Peninsula regional open space district manages, um, but they can also have uh, smaller parks that are more facility driven, uh, like their Marshall Cottle Park or um, Hillier County Park that are, they're a bit smaller, but they'll have more picnic tables, playground sort of situations. Um, they always do have hiking on these parks, but it's got a little bit different um, facility to them. Santa Clara Open Space Authority, it's a relatively newer agency. I believe they got started in the 1990s, um, but they are growing pretty quickly. They have a lot of really great parkland in the Morgan Hill area. I know Rancho Cañada del Oro is a really um, popular preserve to go hike at. And then lastly, but not least, California State Parks. They're all over California, 
We do have some great areas locally. Castle Rock State Park, for example, is off of Skyline Boulevard and Highway 9. Um, closer to the Morgan Hill Gilroy area, there's Henry Coe Park, where um, I know I've done a lot of hiking when I was younger as well. So if we click on the Open Space website, we want to just kind of give you a quick look at our the website for our agency. Most of the agencies, when we went um, to go look at their websites, almost all of them on the left side had a tab where to go visit a preserve. They were always very uniform like that. So we'll scroll down a little bit. Midpen manages 65,000 acres, so we are quite a large agency. Um, and most of the agencies have some sort of map like this where you can find a preserve near you. So you can look, um, like if you're in the Cupertino, Los Altos area, our Rancho San Antonio preserve is the nearest parkland. It's probably also our, our well, it very is our busiest park out there. So Greg's just giving you a quick um, show of how quick it is to find a park. He's chosen Sierra's little open space preserve. It's our most Southern park. It's in kind of South San Jose area. This is the first page you see. And what's important here is that you have a download map feature. So say you're on your cell phone, you've been doing your research at home, you've gone through the website, you say, this is the place I wanna go, download the map on your phone, have it on your phone before you ever get to the park. That way you're not relying on an internet connection, you're just relying on that cell phone battery. And like Greg said earlier, make sure it's charged because it's gonna be using a lot of energy if you're gonna be using the maps and using a GPS. Um, it does drain the battery quite a bit. So this is just a quick example of the map that would pop up on your cell phone. So while we're looking at the map right here, you can see on it um, how it'll start having various symbols like dogs or no dogs in areas. Um, some of those rules that Greg was mentioning earlier today. So we're just going to try to navigate to back to the PowerPoint and we're going to go click on one of the other agency websites for you. I wanted to find, I um, <clears throat> wanted to show you folks something too here. So right here for Sierra Azul, it gives our hours, one half hour before sunrise till a half hour for sunset. Um, it gives you uh, also like what you would find, the type of hiking, uh, the, the amount of elevation that you would climb. Um, talks about the varied landscape, offers visitors views of serpentine grasslands, rocky and steep chaparral, dense stands of bay trees, shaded oak woodland forest. So it gives you a description of the different types of um, um, topography and uh, what type of um, environment you, you'll be in. So like the per question that person had is when you go to the park agency's websites, usually they have a description of what you'll see on your hike or at least in the area. Um, it also talks about what animals that you might see there too. So I just wanted to show that really quick. Rebecca, did you have some questions? Um, yeah, let's take a look. Um, one question is, aren't there different trails with different crowd levels in even popular parks? I went to Mission Peak the other day and there were some really crowded ones, uh, but there wasn't anyone at another trail. Yeah, so like Andrew was saying, like Rancho San Antonio, that's one of the busiest parks that we have. Um, usually the further you drive out, usually the, the quieter the park is. Um, Sierra Azul uh, on weekends is really busy. Week, weekdays, it's not very busy. Um, again, that's something that you can call the agency of the park that you're visiting. And you can either ask somebody at the front desk or they'll transfer you to a ranger. And we can give you uh, good ideas on what hikes to do where if you, if you want to be out in an area where you don't come across a lot of people, like Ranger Andy was saying, or if, if you're more comfortable around a lot of people. Uh, it's best always just to call the park agency because generally the websites won't tell you, oh, come come to this park at this time during this time of the week and you won't see anyone type of thing. 
Um, Cause I'm like Mount Eminem, for example, at the very top during the weekdays, it's almost like you have the place to yourself, but on the weekends, it's almost like a small Yosemite where you're just almost elbow to elbow um, with people. So um, we're just going to talk about topo maps really quick and how to read them. So basically, um, some maps have topo markings on it, which are what you see is like this. And so you have the contour interval, you have the contour line and the index contour. So basically, um, the first line on the bottom, let's just say that's zero feet. And the next line up here would be 100 feet. So in between each one of these little intervals is 10 feet. So the wider the intervals are, the smoother the trail is and less of an incline. The steeper or closer the lines are means that it's very steep. So basically, this is like a two-dimensional view of topo lines, but over to the left here is what this actually looks like. So if you're hiking along, you see a trail that hikes along the trail like this, you notice you're just staying in one topo line. But if you decided to go straight up, by seeing these lines and how closely they get to it, it's like you're almost climbing up a, a steep clip. So it, it's a really quick, you know, um, review of this, but um, that's what topo lines are for the most part. Yeah, for a lot of folks here for beginning hiking, typically you want to go <laughs> over as few of the topo lines, the contour lines, as possible. Because um, the more you're doing, the more strenuous, the more uphill you're going to do, or the more steep downhill you're going to be doing try to find kind of some areas that are more flat. Um, if you start seeing trails that have a lot of switchbacks on them, on the map, when you're looking at it, it's, it's something that's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's a really good indication that you're gonna be in a steep area. And the reason that you're doing those switchbacks in that manner is so that you're going slowly from one side um, to another, you're elongating the distance so that you're not going straight up, which would be extremely strenuous to do. So we've got just a few examples of some of the preserves around here. Um, this is Almaden Quick Silver County Park. This is the map that will show when you go to their agency website. Um, we just wanted to kind of bring this up to, to give you a quick overview of like the map legend of it. And Greg's going to pull up another one real quick right here. Um, this is going to be Cañada del Oro. Uh, we like this map a little bit better because you can really see those contour lines of it. And the other thing that we want to go over here is mileage markers on these maps. Um, so I don't believe we're going to be, oh, we do have our little, our little cursor. So say we're on the Mayfair Trail, Mayfair Ranch Trail. If we're following this, you can see that we're actually not going over too many topo or contour lines, uh, at least for the beginning of it. And it's not till you get to about 3.1 miles into your trail that all of a sudden, the way that this map is, do you see how the contour lines are kind of going? Um, there are several in a row. They're going this direction. Um, and this means that it's going to be a very steep incline or decline. Um, this direction that you would be traveling, you'd be traveling downhill really steep um, until you get to roughly here where you're basically near a creek bed and you'd be following the creek bed out. Um, what we want to show as well with these contour lines is mileage. The way that this map does it and the way that most maps do it um, is going to be between kind of a dot situation right here. Um, to here and mid pen, our maps are very similar where in between dots, it's gonna be a different mileage. So this first section is gonna be 3.1 miles. Um, this sometimes confuses people. They think that their whole entire hike might be 3.1 miles on this trail, but it's just 3.1 miles to the next intersection. After that, your next intersection, if you go this way would be one or would be 0.5 and this direction would be 1.5. Greg, do you have a little bit to add? Yeah, let me see if we can find that. Were you going to go to the state park one? Yeah, I think state park one was this guy right over, right to the left of it. 
Well, we'll just <clears throat> show you an example of our Rancho map. So like what An Andrew was saying was that between each point, when you see a 0 0.5 or 1.6, it's from one trail intersection to the other. So if you think, oh, I'm gonna do a three mile hike, you don't wanna add up three miles one way because that's gonna be a total of six miles. So you wanna add up the mileage. So where you start and where you end is gonna be a total of three miles or four miles or, or just even a mile. So we had sure. all these maps already. Now I can't. I think it was down by bush brochures. Okay. So we're at the state park website now. Um, and we we're going to pull up one of their maps because one of the unique things that we found on one of the state park maps was how there were no contour lines on the map. Um, and I remember growing up here locally, I happened to hike at this one park. Um, I guess Greg's going to pull up Castle Rock State Park, but earlier we were looking at one for Henry Coe State Park, which is in kind of the Morgan Hill, uh, Gilroy area. And the hike that we did, we decided to start in the early afternoon um, because we were only going to do somewhere around six to eight miles. And we were thinking to ourselves, okay, six to eight miles, we can do that in probably two to three hours total. Um, we got our map you know, found, found that it was going to be six to eight miles. Uh, we started our hike and because there were no contour lines on it, we didn't realize that we were going to be hiking an extremely uh, steep terrain. So what we thought would be two to three hours took us four to five hours. We were completely exhausted. We were extremely low on water. Um, and it kind of showed us how ill-prepared we were that day to hike. Now this map of Castle Rock State Park, uh, quite a bit different than the one at Henry Coe, where you can see how steep the terrain is uh, in this area. For about, oh, and then here's, our, here's the map of Henry Coe State Park, where you can see all it's showing is the trails, campgrounds, uh, the parking lots, but it doesn't show you how steep any of the terrain is out there, which it is actually quite steep. So weather and time, so that's really important when you guys go out hiking for a first time or just in general. Um, you always wanna check the weather. What's the weather gonna be like? If it's gonna be a really hot day, well, you're gonna to wanna to bring light clothing, sunscreen, hat, water again, and you wanna take breaks in the shade, uh, more breaks than uh, you think you probably need. Cause you wanna watch out for, over, for overheating in yourself and others. Um, I can share a little experience with you guys. So, you know, park rangers, you think, oh, hey, these guys are in the out, outside all the time. They know what they're doing. Um, they're always prepared. Well, um, one summer it was over 100 degrees and there was a vehicle parked in a closed area. And so I went out looking for them and I just brought one bottle of water because I, I thought, well, I'm not going to be out there for very long. What ended up happening was is that I started following a little creek. And then I'm like, well, I'll go a little further. I'll go a little further. And I kept on going probably about two miles in. And by two miles, um, I drank all my water. Uh, I noticed that I was starting to develop a little heat stress. I stopped sweating. My, my face was getting red. And so I turned around, came back another mile, and I had to stop because I couldn't go any further because I felt the symptoms getting worse. So I had to call for other rangers. And in turn, they called uh, for fire and ambulance. And they actually had to come out to me and uh, I had to take, um, I was given an IV bag full of liquid um, right then and there on that spot. And that was enough to make me feel a little better to hike out to uh, where my truck was, where I had to, had to get another IV bag of, uh, of, of liquid. So it's, it's really important. You think, oh, I'm just gonna go on a, a short hike and I'm just gonna bring a little bottle of water with me. You should always bring more water than you think because you can be out there thinking, oh, I can go a little further. Oh, I can go a little further. And then the next thing you know, you're in trouble. So that's why water is so important. Even in the winter time, it's just an important thing to carry with you. Um, in the cold, you want to make sure you bring enough layers to keep you warm. Um, winter caps, um, any type of shoes really are fine. But if they get wet, um, just remember your feet are going to get cold and always bring snacks with you too. Cause even when it's cold out and you're out there, your body needs 
that nourishment uh, to, to um, stay warm and burn those calories. If it's rainy and windy, again, you just dress appropriately to that. It's always important to um, bring an extra change of clothes in the car because you're going to be cold, you're going to be wet, and then you don't want to go in your car cold and wet. You turn on that heater, and the next thing you know, all your windows are fogging up because all the condensation from you being wet. So bring a change of clothes, go in the restroom, change it to something nice and dry, and the ride home will be more comfortable. I just want to throw in there on um, when you're hiking and it's getting hot, taking those breaks in the shade, um, try to time them out. Put your timer, your cell phone, you got it with you. Um, put a timer on for like 15 minutes to 30 minutes, depending on how you're feeling that day and how hot it is. Um, your cell phone timer goes off. You stop at the next spot where there's shade, drink just a little bit of water, take a minute, look around your surroundings, take everything in, uh, check on your partner that's with you and then put that timer back on and, and head back out. Um, by doing something like that, you're gonna keep yourself hydrated out there. You'll keep yourself full of energy to keep going and hike further. Yeah, and another thing with heat, you know, people love to hike with their dogs, but I can't tell you folks how many, how many times that we've had medical calls for dogs because people think, oh, it's, you know, they, if I can handle the heat, the dog can handle the heat. Well, dogs can't handle um, heat or get rid of heat as much as humans can. Um, the way they cool themselves off is through panting and um, their paws. So that's how a ski, heat escapes that way too. So if it's 90 degrees or more and you want to go on a long hawk with the dog, just remember that the dog can't really get, cool himself when it's hot like that. Uh, and unfortunately, we've lost dogs um, because they've because of the heat stress was so bad that um, their bodies couldn't take it. So it's pretty sad. So just remember, you know, that's your little buddy, your friend that, you know, take him into consideration and hike on mild days with him and not on super hot days, because that's the last thing you want is to be out there and then your dog have some type of medical emergency. So a little bit more about this. We went over weather, but what about what time of day to hike? So in general, given our local area, mornings typically end up being the cooler times of day to go hike, uh, especially out here in the summertime. So if you do come out here hiking between say June and probably about September, uh, typically you wanna try to aim for the morning time. If you are hiking between 12 and five, a lot of times that's the hottest time of day. Um, it won't be nearly as enjoyable out there. Now think of the sunset as well. Um, in the summertime, sun's out a lot later, uh, gets to be about 8.30 is kind of sunset a lot of times around this area in the midsummer. Um, but during the winter time, it could be 5.30, 6 o'clock. And a lot of the local parks, there's rules about when you can't be there, uh, which is typically either sunset or half hour after sunset. So even though you're out there hiking at 8.30 in the summertime, yeah, you can't be out there at 8.30 in the dead of winter time at a lot of the places locally to us. Um, now, there was a question earlier about the busiest. Um, it, it was a Mission Peak question about it was really busy over there and hiking. And there was another trail, though, that didn't have very many folks on it. Um, most folks know that it's going to be as well. It's going to be busier in the morning time at most of these parks, too. Um, so finding parking a lot of times ends up being the most difficult thing uh, to start your hike in general, because a lot of the parks only have a limited number of space. We've got so many people here in the Bay Area, everybody's fighting for a parking spot. I highly recommend that if you're going on a weekend day to get to that park early in the morning or try to time it where it's more so in the evening, sometime after that, um, that, that five o'clock, that hottest hottest part of the day, um, where it's gonna be a little bit cooler outside. Typically that late in the afternoon, there is gonna be less people. Rebecca, is there some questions that you'd like us to go over before we continue? Uh, we can save them for the end. You guys go ahead. Okay. So that takes us to environmental hazards. So um, poison oak, that's it's prevalent everywhere in the Bay Area, Santa Cruz mountains. Um, so the kind of general rule of thumb is leaves of three, let them be. Um, if you do get exposed to poison oak, um, it causes severe rashes, blisters, and can be very itchy. 
Also, what people don't think too is that if they take their dog on a walk um, on the trails and there's poison oak all around it and the dog goes and does its business, and if the dog brushes up against the poison oak, well, now the dog has poison oak on the fur and animals in general don't get poison oak. But when you go to pet your dog and then you go touch your face, you go touch your arm, whatever, now you've exposed yourself to poison oak. There's an oil on the poison oak that has a severe reaction, I'd say, to most of the general population. Um, and it can be very uncomfortable to have poison oak. Uh, adding that in with the poison oak, the, the photo that we have here, this is what poison oak typically looks like um, in the springtime. Uh, it's, uh, it's a brighter greenish color, but it's not always like that. You actually do get poison oak that uh, is going to be a reddish color. Um, this is when it's, it's late summer. Uh, it's, uh, it starts to change its color. And then in the dead of winter, sometimes poison oak will even drop all the leaves and it'll just be vines out there. And you can still get poison oak from the vines. All of these stages, every one of these stages, from it being fresh to it being um, this reddish where it's kind of starting to die off um, to the vines will have poison oak on them. So if you do get poison oak on you or you think you may be exposed to poison oak, best thing right after your hike, head home, take a cool shower. Um, typically taking a cooler shower uh, with soap and water will be able to get the poison oak off of you. Really hot showers um, will actually open up the pores of your skin. The poison oak can get in there better um, and it's gonna end up lasting longer. It's gonna be a lot more miserable. Uh, with the poison oak, if you don't wash it off right away, um, you can have some other exposures with it where it starts getting on your clothes or your bed sheets where then you may two or three days from then um, have to end up changing bed sheets, washing different clothes that you didn't think you were going to have to wash um, because now they have poison oak on them. Yeah. And if you realize you didn't touch any poison oak, but you have it um, and you had your uh, dog with you, then it's a good idea to wash your dog too. Yes. Wash the dog when you get home. Rattlesnakes. So um, we have a few different snakes around this area, but the rattlesnake is the only one that's going to be poisonous out here. The great thing about poison or the great thing about rattlesnakes is they let you know where they are. So I've never run into a situation where I accidentally almost stepped on a rattlesnake because probably about three to four feet before you ever get to that rattlesnake, they let you know where they are. It's a very unique, almost buzzing of a rattle noise. Um, it instinctually, I would have to say you basically stop. Um, that's what I've seen a lot. Every time somebody's been near me and you hear a rattlesnake, everybody just kind of freezes. Take a moment to collect yourself and slowly back away. Um, typically the rattlesnake might be sunbathing on a path that's in front of you. Maybe it blended in and kind of looked like a stick. Um, give the rattlesnake some space. If it's a really, really wide trail, take as far away spot to walk around it as possible. If not, just walk a little ways away from it, back up, take a break, drink some water, um, let the snake move on on its own. The, the snakes will move on if you're in the area because they don't, we're way too big for a snake to eat. So they're not gonna, they don't wanna bite us to eat us like a mouse where they'll just hang out there for the mouse. We're way bigger than them. They don't wanna be near us and they should mosey along their way very shortly. Yeah, like uh, Andrew said, you just don't wanna panic. You just wanna stop, listen for the sound, look around to see where the sound is coming from. And then you can, um, uh, do what you need to do to get away from the snake. Uh, again, the snake doesn't really want to bite us, doesn't want to harm us. He's just warning us to know that, hey, I'm right here. You need to back off. And that's why it's a good reason, too, to have your dog on a leash at all times. Because if your dog's out in front of you and you can't pull him back because you heard that sound of the rattlesnake, unfortunately, your dog can get bit. And usually it's a terminal for, for the dogs. So that's another good reason why you should always have your dog on leash for his protection. So mountain lions or pumas or cougars. So we do have mountain lions in the Santa Cruz mountains. And um, if you're lucky enough, you'll see one, but more than likely when you're hiking the trails, you've probably walked past one and not even know it. Uh, for the most part, they're pretty docile. You won't see them. 
Um, juveniles or, uh, or sick cats might show some interest in people, but for the most part, um, they'll leave us alone. Um, if you see a, if you see a, a mountain lion on the trail, you just stop. You don't want to run out, turn your back and run away from it. You want to make yourself appear as large as possible. You want to make as many loud noises as you can. And for the most part, for the most part, the cat will just uh, meander off the trail and you'll never see it again. But they're few and far between sightings of mountain lions. I've seen quite a few mountain lions being a park ranger here for 16 years. Uh, they're very majestic cats. They're very powerful. They're very strong. They can cover a lot of ground really quickly. Um, I've seen one jump uh, a two lane highway with one leap. Um, just imagine like your house cat on, on the floor and how easily it jumps onto your kitchen table. Well, imagine a cat, you know, the size of a mountain lion and what it can leap. I've seen them leap um, a 10 foot wide stream like it was nothing. Uh, they're very beautiful to see, but it's one thing to see them like when you're at the zoo, but when you're out in the open, you really get that feeling of, oh man, you know, th this cat is out here with me. There's no barrier. Yeah. It's a little nerve wracking, but you know, once that encounter is over, it's something you can tell your friends. If you happen to have your camera out and take a picture of it, um, it, it's an, it's an amazing thing to see one of these out in the wild. I gotta say, Greg's a lot luckier than I am in my 15 to 16 years of working in the park industry. I've only gotten to see two mountain lions, uh, and that's it. And basically it, it exhibited all the normal behavior. It didn't want anything to do with me. In both cases, it jumped on the road, jumped off the road and just sauntered away. Uh, it had no care to hang out with me out there. They're pretty much solitary creatures. So again, if you see one, consider yourself very lucky. Coyotes. Um, so coyotes are a lot more frequent than the mountain lions out there. Um, the coyotes, they'll probably get 20, 30 feet away from you, just kind of see, oh, you're a person. And then they'll just probably just walk away for the most part. Um, more so coyotes interactions with dogs are where we sometimes as rangers kind of see more um, negative behavior at times. And as rangers, this is one of the reasons that we stress people keeping their dogs on leashes out in the parks. Um, as a ranger in Chico, California, before coming here, we have probably a 1, 1,500 area, acre area um, where you can have your dogs off leash all the time. And unfortunately, that was the same area where we'd get the most frequent coyote attacks on dogs because people had their dogs off leash and they were small to medium sized dogs and the coyotes would attack them from time to time. So, um, but we never had any attacks where the person had their small to medium sized dogs on a leash with the person uh, because the person is so much larger than a coyote. Coyote is only 30, 40 pounds that the coyote won't wanna be close to a person. And another good reason to have your dogs on leash, and more importantly, if you have go hiking with a smaller dog, and if you do see a coyote, best thing to do is just pick up the small dog and and just hold it until the coyote leaves. They're just very curious, but they're not they they're not necessarily aggressive. So deer, you'll see these little guys pretty much everywhere, and. Um, like at Rancho, we have tons of deer and the visitors think that they're tame and that we uh, bring them in at night and then we let the deer out in the morning because there's so many of them and they're always there. Um, they think it Rancho is like a little zoo. But for the most part, you see the deer, um, just you know, leave them alone. You don't want to be like these visitors in Yellowstone where they approach the bison and you know something happens. These deer do have sharp hooves and they are willing to protect themselves. So it's always better when you see them, just kind of appreciate them from afar, take some pictures. But for the most part, like any other wildlife, you just kind of want to just let them do their own thing and just uh, not interact with them. So what are some ideas for beginner hikes? All right. Um, start small out here, work your way up to doing longer hikes. Some of the mistakes that I made when I was younger and just first started doing my hiking um, I, I was almost too adventurous. I wanted to do more and more and more. And I'd find myself by the end of the hike kind of begrudgingly saying like, gosh, that's not, not having that much fun. I'm super tired. I still got X amount of miles to go. Gosh, why do people think this is enjoyable? Well, it's because I was pushing myself too hard. 
I was trying to do too, too many trails that were too steep, that were too long. If I would have stuck to, let's just do a flat trail today. Let's just go a couple miles out there. Um, let's find a nice loop that is five to six miles. The more hiking you do, the more you'll probably figure out kind of a, a threshold for yourself that um, for me, five to six miles is a great hike. For a few other people, eight to 10 miles might be a great hike for them. And other folks like my parents, two to four miles, they love it. They do 30 minutes to an hour of hiking um, and they're done, they love it. Uh, so another thing though, besides the terrain or doing loops, nature trails. These are awesome for beginner hikers. They're typically a little bit shorter trails. They give you opportunities to take lots of breaks by having some sort of guided tour where you'll follow a brochure, um, hopefully you've got it downloaded on your phone. Um, some of them even have these audio kind of tours now for some of the parks where you get to a certain spot and your phone will start telling you regarding what type of tree you're seeing, what type of historical structure you're seeing, what type of um, say native plants or wildflowers you're encountering or should be encountering in that spot. Um, so more and more parks are adapting these. You've got to go kind of to each individual park website uh, to find out what they might offer themselves. Um, and lastly, just it's okay to do a short hike. It's okay, like I was kind of saying earlier, start small and then um, go longer the more you feel comfortable. Uh, just a little reminder though, everyone, remember what you hike down, you must hike back up, all right? Uh, we do encounter, I think myself and Greg quite often, a number of folks that they go hike downhill for five or six miles and it doesn't hit them uh, till they get to the bottom of hiking five or six miles. They've got to then hike that five or six miles back uphill. Um, and you can't call a taxi or an Uber to bring you back up. It's usually a, no. one of us rangers that are going down to bring them back up to their car. Yeah. So kind of lessons from us, a ranger. So the most important thing is be safe out there. Um, when you go out, bring a friend, you know, it's always enjoyable to have somebody to talk to and chat with when you're out there and in case something happens, at least you have a buddy with you there. Um, kind of an important thing is if you're going out by yourself, um, let someone know where you're going. Um, say, you know, little Susie, hey mom, I'm going to go to Sierra Zool. Um, I'm going to park at Jacques Ridge parking lot. I'm going to go on the woods trail and I should be back, you know, home by five. So if something happens, you get lost or you decide, oh, you know, I'm going to explore this trail and then you get lost or whatnot. Um, five o'clock comes around, 536, little Susie's mom knows like, oh, hey, she's not back yet. Let me call the place, the agency that she went hiking at. And then for us, it makes it a lot easier for us to find that person if we know when they started, where they parked what trails that they're on. So that's really important to do that just in case anything happens, uh, people know where you're at. Uh, another big one is don't leave valuables in plain sight in your car. Unfortunately, a lot of people like to take advantage of uh, parking lots and parks only because they know, hey, if I see a car there, usually that person's gonna be gone for several hours. So um, they take advantage of that. They'll break in the cars. They'll, you know, if there's a wallet there, a purse, a backpack. Uh, electronics, um, they'll just break into your car. And that's the last thing you want is be on a nice hike, come back, and then your car has been broken into and dealing with that. So it's just better to leave everything at home, maybe put it in the trunk if, if you forgot to take stuff out. But um, yeah, you just want to make sure that you have someone looks in your car, they don't see anything but a cell phone charger. Yeah, when possible too with this, with the valuables, um, don't wait till you get to the park to go hide them, say, in the trunk. Uh, do that when you are at your house or if you had stopped by, say, a store, go pick up some water and food before going hiking. When you're there in that parking lot, take your valuables. If you do have some with you, put them in the trunk then. That way, if someone does come around the parking lot and they are kind of looking through, they basically see just an empty vehicle and they're not going to go break a window and go try to grab anything that's not there. Yep. So enjoyment. All right. Um, this is kind of my favorite part of, of going hiking. Yeah. Um, it's just getting out there, walking quietly, getting time to yourself, just enjoying the sounds of nature. Um, I know some people like playing music when they're out there. 
you can play music at your house, you can play music in your car, uh, but you can't get those same sounds that you got from hiking in the park at your house or in your car. So take that all in, um, go slow, enjoy the smells of the preserves. You will definitely notice a difference when you get some of the parks out there that are some of the more remote parks, it'll just smell different. It'll smell clean compared to being in the cities out here. If you see something interesting, take a moment and experience it. Uh, if you're hiking the same trail four or five times in a row, I guarantee you that the fifth or sixth time, there's something unique that you're gonna come across, something that you won't have seen the last time you were there. Maybe it's always been there, but you'll just notice it this one this time. Um, take those moments in, take those frequent breaks that you can look around you out here. Um, and remember, as a park ranger from us, take only memories, leave only footprints. Yeah, if, if you're snacking on stuff, eating, drinking, just make sure you take it with you. Um, the, the parks are for you guys to enjoy and nothing's worse than walking down a trail and all you see is trash. So uh, just take that into consideration um, because nature is there for you to enjoy so you can decompress, relax, and just make it your own adventure. All right, that's it. Any questions? We definitely have a lot of questions. Um, before we dive into our last questions for this program, I do want to offer, um, because there are so many questions and we're not going to be able to answer all of them, um, if you have um, any that you'd like to directly ask the park rangers, feel free to email them at info at openspace.org and uh, someone will get back to you with an answer for your question. Um, so just to kick us off, um, we have a question from Kat. I have been told not to wear 100% cotton clothing because it absorbs sweat and does not dry fast and you can freeze if it is cold out. What type of clothing fabric is best that dries easily or is breathable? Hi there, Kat, it's uh, Ranger Andrew. Um, so growing up as a Boy Scout, they have kind of a, a saying that they have, it's, it's cotton kills. Because you're right, a lot of times cotton, although you may start your hike and it's a really comfortable, nice, safe t-shirt on, um, you start sweating in it, it gets wet and it, it holds that moisture into it. And so if you end up running into a situation where, although maybe you're hiking right now and it's hot outside, that you continue hiking and it's gonna get cold outside, um, this is really impactful, like say when you're backpacking and you don't, um, you're not going to be back at your vehicle where you can warm up yourself. All you have is this t-shirt. Uh, you'll stay cold and you can wind up getting hypothermia is basically what would happen next. And then you can go into shock uh, if you're not able to warm yourself up. As far as what fabrics go, honestly, I'm not like, I'm not an expert on what all the fabrics are. Maybe Greg might know some of them, but at most of your stores, like the REI stores, they'll have specific types of t-shirts and pants that won't have cotton in them. Um, they're of other material um, because, you know, they're, they're catering specifically for this clientele. Um, and they know, you know, cotton kills <laughs> in a way of, of that old phrase. Um, so everything is, they're made of the materials that will wick the moisture away mm -hmm. that will dry out a lot quicker. Um, it's also why we, we encourage people hiking in layers um, so that if something does get wet, it can get removed and you can get something else on. Usually any type of like moisture wicking, wicking materials will work. Um, I have a lot of Mary wool, um, shirts and long johns, long sleeve shirts, um, for like winter time that seems to keep the heat in. And it, even if it gets wet, it'll, it'll keep the heat. Cause it's just, uh, it's wool. So wool does that. It'll yeah. keep the heat when it's wet. So it just depends again on uh, what season you're hiking in, but a lot of the uh, wicking moisting, moisture uh, materials, like Andrew said, like REI, um, you ask a salesperson, they'll be able to. Yeah, and I think it's polyester blends yeah, poly is what you'll, you'll see a lot of times being advertised actually. Polypropylene, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so another question we have is, um, if on the websites that you guys mentioned, um, they're unable to find information about a specific trail, is there another resource that um, hikers can check out for more information? 
Well, uh, if you go to mid pan site and say uh, you can't find a, a certain trail that someone has told you about on the website, call the main office. Um, if they can't answer you, they'll transfer the uh, call to one of the rangers, and then we'll be able to help you out with that. Um, because yeah, sometimes the, some of the websites it's hard to navigate and find the exact trail. But again, if you call the agency and uh, they'll be able to help you out with that. Yeah, I'm thinking this is a good time. Um, like Greg mentioned, call the agency and try to get a hold of a park ranger. There's a lot of times where I'll be at a certain location. And somebody will ask me about some sort of trail or viewpoint that they can't find on the map. And that's because the trails changed names over the years or it's a trail or location that basically it's kind of gotten a local name that only certain folks have, have called it that. But as the park rangers, it's our job to intimately know the parks, know what, know the history of it, that like say Rancho San Antonio, one of our most popular areas, uh, for the longest time we had a trail called the pg &E Trail. It's now called the Stevie Abers Trail. So if you'd gotten the recommendation of to go hike at Rancho San Antonio on the pg &E Trail and you get there, and all you find is, well, you don't find pg &E Trail. Right. That's where you need to um, get one of our knowledges to come out and help you out with that. And another one is like, um, if you're a mountain bicyclist, uh, you might know Corte Madera Skeggs. So if someone tells you, hey, you got to go to Skeggs and ride, and, and like, who is that? Oh, that's Mid Pen property. You go to Mid Pen property, you're not going to find a Skeggs preserve. It's El Corte de Madera Creek preserve. So that's one of those things where, yeah, that's why it's great to ask uh, or call the agency and say, hey, I'm looking for Skeggs, but it's not on your website. They can get to us and we're like, oh yeah, Skeggs is really a court of Madeira. So that's a good resource there. And using like other apps, like all trails and um, other apps like that, they're okay. But if you're looking on, they, they don't necessarily tell you, well, this trail is dogs prohibited or this trail is bikes prohibited or this trail you can't ride e-bikes. So it's always best to go to the agency's website that you're visiting. That way you get the accurate information of uh, the trails, what you can do on them and what kind of um, user groups can use those preserves and trails. You know, I, I do wanna reiterate something Greg just mentioned there, um, using some of the third party um, websites or apps to find trails. It's a good way to, um, to start doing some research on it, but you really do need to go to the agency's website um, before finalizing your plans. I often have run into people in our closed areas that they're not allowed to be at because they're following a trail from say all trails. And they say, look, it shows up on all trails as a, a trail to go hike on. And you say, I'd Bye. see it's on that, but that's not open to the public. You shouldn't be here. Um, all of our trails show up on the map and this shows up as a closed area on our maps. You're using another person's um, recommendation that they shouldn't have put up on there. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more. Um, just to reiterate, if you need the email um, to reach out to our park rangers, it's info at openspace.org. Um, so for our last question, um, which preserves have easier to get parking? Oh, geez. <laughs> well, on the weekend, it's almost virtually impossible unless you get there super early in the morning. Weekdays, usually parking lots are wide open. Like we keep mentioning Rancho. If you don't get Rancho, like as soon as the gates open, uh, you'll be like circling the parking lot like um, like wagon on a wagon train. It's just it's almost impossible. So really on the weekends, you really have to plan and get there early. Yeah, I think for us, maybe our Skyline Ridge Preserve has a lot of parking available. Um, but that's going to be on Skyline Boulevard near Alpine Road, um, just because it's a very, very large parking lot and it's a bit of a more remote area. So it doesn't quite get filled up often. Right. Uh, but yeah, a lot of the places I could think of fill up on the weekends. Bear Creek Preserve. Bear Creek Preserve. Uh, Fremont Older. Um, some of our preserves, unfortunately, don't have parking like St. Joseph's Hill or El Sereno. Okay, well, I believe that brings us to the conclusion of our program. I want to thank everyone for coming today. Thank you to Greg and Andrew for this incredible program. Um, yeah, this was great. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Take care and enjoy the outdoors. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks.